short journey together, 15 minutes. So I'll start to say who I am. Uh, why do I care about XR? Um, what are some good open source examples in terms of content? Uh, understanding one example in web VR, one in web AR that we might try live or maybe not depending on time. What I think are exciting new workflows and why you should do what you should do or maybe not. So, well, the web is a mess, but in my opinion, it's an exciting and creative mess uh, because you let anybody do anything. So I am Fabien Benetou, Utopia on Twitter. Uh, I work for the European Parliament. Uh, I think nobody knows about this, but the European Parliament has an innovation service where basically uh, I play with gadget. So that's not the official mission. The official mission is we do two things. Uh, we challenge the workflow. So for example, maybe uh, everybody is using an abacus instead of using a proper calculator. Maybe that's not okay. Maybe architects are only drawing on papers. Maybe they could use VR. Uh, so they are basically uh, trying new building proof of concept, building prototypes, trying new tools, basically. And the other thing is maybe those tools are actually scary or creepy. So maybe there should be regulation around it so that those new technologies are used right. Um, so I do this three days per week. And then also I work for UNICEF. I think anybody, everybody knows UNICEF. What I think nobody knows. Um, does anybody know actually that UNICEF has an innovation fund? Okay, cool, nobody knows, so that's good. Uh, the innovation fund is about 15 or 20 million dollars. And the idea is that you have emerging technologies like VR, like AR, that have a huge potential and that can help at scale children in thousands or even millions. So you need to find the intersection between those emerging technologies that can have a large scale impact uh, and entrepreneurs who want to actually implement it. Uh, and then it's run um, in schools, for nurses, uh, any way that can impact them. Uh, it's too hard, so that's why I don't do it myself, and that's why UNICEF doesn't do it, but that entrepreneurs, uh, so I was there in Ghana in March or April, and in Nigeria, uh, where we've met Kabiro, who has a startup called Nubian VR, and they want to use VR in education. I mean, they don't want to. They are working on developing VR solution for schools in Ghana. Uh, other ones that are uh, using it for, um, let's say you don't have a chemistry lab, you should have a chemistry lab. Uh, but you don't have all the tools, you need to keep everything clean and neat. Uh, and when you don't even have books, that might be a little bit tricky. So the idea is you can actually dematerialize it. It's not as good as the actual physical lab, but it's always so much better than just talking about it on a blackboard. So I help them in terms of technical support. And also to clarify before the, the break, I do not work at Mozilla. I'm a contributor, I'm a most tech speaker. Uh, and basically I showcase and play with the technology. So that's, that's the, how do you say, uh, the fair warning there. And still, I have some goodies for questions at the end, so we'll have to have good questions. Um, so just out of curiosity, quick show of hands, also to make sure everybody's still awake in the morning. Um, who tried web VR? Who tried web AR? Who tried web XR? Who built anything in web XR? I guess not if nobody tried it. Who build anything in web VR? Who build anything in web AR? Kind of, I mean, building something is like having one page where you modify one line of code. I think that's, it's, it's a start. Yeah, <laughs> and so like writing a little bit gently. Okay, cool. Um, so actually, why do I care about it and why did I start all this? Um, so as you saw from the very, very beginning, I have my brain dump or my wiki uh, where I, I put, a lot of stuff, too much stuff. You, again, you don't want to go there. But to me, it's pretty precious. I started because I have um, paper notebooks where I write a um, bunch of ideas, concept. Then I'm doing Inktober. Same, you don't want to know all this, but that's okay. Uh, and then sometimes I do presentation. So I, I do the sketches there. The problem is it's stuck there. So if I want to share with you those visuals, it just doesn't get there. Um, and what I started to do is because when I share it, I get feedback on it, I can improve on it. So I started to put it online. I started actually with mind maps before. I don't know if you tried mind maps. Works pretty well, I like it. Helps me to summarize, but at least to me, it didn't scale. So I need like something uh, bigger that made links and connection easier. And then I started to play with wiki and it's like, wow, this is what I need. And I can even embed a mind map on my wiki. So I started to have a wiki. I could make links easily, create new pages, have 
uh, embedding, when I have a page in a page, uh, I can have uh, multiple page in a page, I can have sections of page in pages, so I can have a lot of freedom in it. The problem is, as I added more ideas, it got frustrating because everything got stuck in these thin layers, those three millimeters, and when I think of my ideas, um, I think a little bit like you see in the movies also, maybe I was a little bit influenced, but I think I, as ideas are floating stuff all around me. So I tried the DK1 four years ago, I think, I don't know, when it was out, uh, and I was like, wow, first, first thought was, this is amazing, I'm somewhere else. I was in the, uh, what is it, Toscani demo. Uh, it was pretty cool, but then the second thought was like, wow, I can have my ideas all around me, floating as posters, uh, infinite amount of space, uh, freely reorganizing in any way I want. Uh, and, and I thought it's exciting and it's good for me, but I think it's also there is some cognitive basis for it, uh, I don't know if anybody tried the, um, the method of the Loki, the memory palace. Uh, so basically, for those who are not familiar with it, is you, you take a place you know well, let's say your house, and then on every, um, either in each room or in every place you're very familiar with, you put some of the items you need to remember. And then you grow a story around it. Uh, and then you, it, it's just a technique, but you're going to remember it. You're going to somehow, this unstructured list is going to stick in your mind. I thought this is strange, but it's probably because, well, you don't want to get lost. You don't want to uh, know where the uh, tiger is not. You don't want to miss your food. Uh, you don't want to miss energy, for example, if you're looking for something uh, that doesn't, uh, yeah, it's good. Um, so you need basically to remember where you went, where you are. Uh, and, and I, yes, it just, Techniques like this from underlying structure of the brain that I think VR, uh, NAR, can leverage quite efficiently. So I did this, which is not much yet, but which is super interesting and important for me, which is the wiki you saw, the web page you saw at the very beginning, but uh, as a kind of little city. So all the pages, based on their length, based on how many edits I have, uh, based on the different links they have, or um, displayed on a uh, directed forest layout, and then I can navigate physically, actually, around my thoughts. It's not that usable, it's not there yet, but at least, so this is why I do VR. This is why I started a couple of years ago to, uh, to go down that path. Uh, and it's not just for the mind, so I had the chance, a couple of, two years ago, I think, to get some terrible neck pain, uh, and I had to do some exercise. I don't know if anybody of you had to do some uh, physiotherapy exercise, but it's, I don't know if I can swear, it's quite boring. Uh, you need to do things like this 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, then like this 10 times, 50 times. Anyway, you don't want to have to go through it, but if you do have to, it could be fun, plus you have one device, so I don't have a VR headset around, but that knows exactly uh, your head position, your orientation constantly. So if you have a... TV series or something you're a fan of, like let's say Rick and Morty, uh, you can actually put it in there and then the cursor is going to let the video play on you when you're looking at it. So this is also like, oh, I started to, to play with VR uh, for things that were important and precious to me and that I could also help others eventually. So this is of course on GitHub. Uh, so if you have at some point to do physiotherapy, you, you know it's really boring. Well, put, let's say, whatever uh, talk you have to uh, watch after and then just do the exercise with it. All this to say that, yeah, I hope everybody gets it here, but VR is not just for game, okay? Uh, entertainment is cool, uh, marketing, why not? But in practice, uh, not just for corporating, it's whatever we here make out of it. And yeah, you have, I don't know, guys in t-shirts that like to walk around people, so a little bit of some of the challenges we might have ahead of us. Um, yeah, I just, for example, in terms of UX, uh, I think it's, I, I cannot help but recommend the Oculus Quest, but I will not buy it. Uh, I, somebody wanted to offer me one, I'm like, no, I cannot accept this. It's in terms of UX, you put the device, no cable, just shove it on, six off, but then who is doing it? For what purpose? So what happened is, so I don't have a Facebook account, no Facebook tools, uh, no WhatsApp, no whatever. Uh, I don't have any Google uh, account, no Drive or anything like this. Uh, what, what happens is, well, of course, with open source, I knew a little bit how it was working, but a couple of months ago, 
so January, right, nearly a year ago, uh, I read uh, this book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, because I was like, wow, this is very strange. Why is Facebook investing in VR? Is it just marketing to say, oh, we're state of the art in terms of technology, or is there something else? And I was like, okay, two billions just to do marketing, it's a bit more, then they have deep pockets. Uh, and if you start to think of uh, Facebook, or so what is Facebook, what is Facebook business model? One word. Data. Nah. Data for what? Advertisement, ads, ads. And ads is changing your behavior. When it's ads just to sell you Coca-Cola, it's annoying, but okay, why not? When it's ads to sell you new political candidates, that's a challenge. It's actually, it's destroying democracy. So I think this is more than just a little bit dangerous. I think it's fucked up. I don't know if I can swear, but this is wrong. Uh, and when you see um, VR as just another, another flow of data so that they can you know your behavior better to change it, then it's really wrong. So just in the context of advertisement, modifying behavior for profit, um, VR as a technology remains exciting. I have friends working at Facebook. Uh, I look at OC6, I see what they're shipping. It is great, but what is it for? I don't think it's that great. So what is great is, so the, those are examples of um, use cases from UNICEF. Um, so Ideas is, uh, is a startup from Turkey, and they are using um, VR for uh, children with PTSD. Um, basically, they get beaten uh, by dogs, and then they don't want to go out anymore. And if you don't go out anymore, you don't go to school. If you don't go to school, you don't get an education, and then life is going to get hard. So they use VR to basically gently, with and without the support of a psychologist, uh, help them to get back outside. Uh, yes, I always have little links, so those little icons there, uh, because they're open source project. So you can actually go, uh, check the code, maybe help them, make suggestion, use it. Um, so yeah, detail on the GitHub, uh, how to do it, they're using Unity, uh, and they are, but they are switching to or well, they're considering switching to WebVR and WebXR and have um, better interaction for the uh, physiotherapist uh, so that he or she can design their experiments. Um, Imizi 3D in, La in Lagos, in Nigeria. Um, the example I mentioned when you don't have a chemistry lab in the school but you want to build it. Uh, so they're working on this. Uh, what happened is, what was it? Like a year and a half ago, I discovered that UNICEF actually is promoting open source. They're seeing it as a tool, a strategical tool, uh, so that, well, hopefully the startup works, and that's great, but then others can benefit from it. And if it doesn't, all the work that was invested, all those code, um, all the code written doesn't have to disappear. Uh, so there were a bunch of repositories uh, using TeleportMe, Nubian that I mentioned before, uh, VAD, VR Maker from China that are doing uh, VR creation tools, all that is on GitHub. And then also some detail on the open source as a business model. How those startups cannot just benefit because UNICEF say open source is good, you should use it, but how it is a strategical tool. Uh, some quick uh, other examples. Um, so anybody who went to the Chaos Computer Congress? One person. Who has never been to the Chaos Computer Congress? Who doesn't know what the Chaos Computer Congress is? Okay, cool. UNESCO, it's, it's like, it's in what, a month, two months now? It is amazing, it is, it is a crazy place, but I mean, in terms of um, uh, what is technology for, and what are the, the um, more than gray areas, <laughs> the areas where it's wrong, I think it's, it's a really interesting conference. Anyway, some of, uh, one of the examples was using VR for, um, you have your two displays, you have the offset, and you can measure basically what is the offset where you're supposed to be and where your eyes are actually looking. And then you can actually adjust because you can render the display with a expected offset, or if somebody has some um, strabism or any kind of problem like this, then you can adjust for it. Uh, also on, on GitLab, I think. It's part of the presentation. It's. Uh, some special effects in the background. Um, one, one quick example also is uh, Mozilla Hub. So who has been in VR in Mozilla Hubs? Okay, very few. Uh, that's good. Every time you don't show up, uh, the hands is not up, you're discovering something, I hope. Uh, it's basically VR that you don't have to be alone. If you want to be alone in your room, you can. If you want to be alone in your room with other people, you also can. Uh, and as quick examples, uh, I was at, uh, I was, 
it's funny that I just said, say this. Um, a conference on UI um, last week, where basically the conference takes place physically. I think it was in it's in the US. In um, forgot in the US. Um, but then you have uh, VR rooms, so you have other, you can go with a headset or without headset, and then you meet people in there. You have the slides going on. You can chat with persons. You have audio, and then you can see on the left also uh, you have the paper that's being discussed. So you don't have to be physically there if you don't want to for whatever reason. Um, the state of the art of your research, and also you have uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Research Field podcast. It's an amazing podcast. Uh, but you also have before, I think it was in big screen, you have discussions live during the podcast. Uh, and it's being recorded and then shared. But you can, now there's considering at least a Mozilla Hubs to, uh, to host the event and go there. So it's not just a hub podcast now, an event in VR. Um, so I keep on mentioning the web. I know most of you are working on a, at a lower level than this. And the argument I hear all the time is like, well, okay, VR is great, AR is great, but it's all about performance. If you don't have performance, you don't hit 60, 90, 120 FPS, so what, what is that for? Uh, well, first, I'll, I'll just do a little, um, uh, how do you say, not challenge, but a bet. We go outside, we, we take a random stranger, not a Unity expert, not somebody who's writing shaders from uh, 6 a.m. to uh, 3, p 3 a.m., but somebody who is just a normal person, and then we ask him or her to compare a web VR or web XR experience with a native one. And if he or she is able to distinguish the two, the champagne is on me. Okay. So we have until the end of the day. Uh, I'm pretty confident, but yeah, we can try this. Um, and then there is the whole workflow. If you build a native app, you actually have to build it. You can improve your workflow, but basically it's a bunch of steps. If you did once, it's okay, but I'm not that smart, so usually I do a bunch of mistakes, which means a cycle that I need to repeat. And as I repeat the cycle, the difference do add up. Uh, so because they do add up and because, I don't know, again, VR is a new medium, AR is a, AR is a new medium, so we need to explore, and that takes a lot of time. So the longer we need to get a feedback loop, the longer we need to get some uh, answer from the person who is actually using it, trying it, then the slower we go. Uh, so anything that helps to make the workflow faster makes such a big difference. And also, even if you don't care about the workflow, uh, as was mentioned during the interaction, it's all about sharing. Uh, you want to share the source, and if you're on the web, well, you have obfuscation techniques, but if you're a normal, nice person, then you can just look at the code of a web page. So in, in terms of learning quickly, uh, having the content, you just inspect your web VR page, your web XR page, your web VR page, and then you can see how it's done. If also, so I, I really think VR is exciting, but it's a black box. Like literally, you put the quest, you have a black box on your face. I think that's creepy. Uh, but if you can tear it apart, open it up, and then see a little bit at least how it's working, then it's a lot more exciting. If you start to bring people for a workshop, let's do a VR workshop, and they have to download um, one or two gigabytes, even with a fast connection, and then everybody has to install it at the same time. Basically, you spend the, less, the first two hours installing it. You can tell people, yeah, install Unity before nobody's going to do it. So you spend the first hours where everybody is pumped up and exciting, doing absolutely nothing interesting. Whereas if you just open a web page, well, you're there. Um, plus, you need to publish it. I mean, once you have your app, it's exciting. You're going to put it in an app store. Well, the top 10 apps is everything Facebook, everything Google, and I think Snapchat or something like this. So good luck. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not going to work. You're going to put more efforts into marketing your thing than actually uh, getting it used. So yeah, good luck on the app stores. So the first, the first second of a web viewer experience, uh, this is Hubs, again, um, ignoring the warnings. Um, it loads A-frame, so who heard about A-frame before? couple of fans, okay, half, more or less. Um, so it's HTML-ish, uh, so it's custom elements, so if you want to write a cube, you write a cube, just as simple as that. So in terms of how quickly a newcomer can have a VR experience, it is pretty amazing. Uh, it's using 3GS, so who is familiar with 3GS? So basically it's 3D on the web, if you do 3D on the web, like, I don't know, I will say a number out of my hat, 80% uh, of, 3D experience at least on the web or using 3GS. Um, and now you have, uh, you start to have 
uh, with multi-view, you start to have really good performance in terms of uh, VR. Um, and it's running on WebGL, so it's running on UGP. So it's not on par, but I would say another number for out of my hat, 80% performance. Again, we can go outside, check with a random stranger if he or she sees the difference in performance. How is this work? It's not the right audience for this, but just a little, a little reminder, you got two eyes, you got two perspectives, a little bit of barrel distortion to um, counteract, let's say, cancel the lenses, um, and you got your golden EVR. The, the big difference, let's say before, is you get pose. So you need your browser to know what pose is to bind it to the camera. Um, just out of curiosity also, this is um, the A-frame inspector. Uh, so the A-frame inspector is, you just start your A-frame page, you see some content, you press Control alt i I remember correctly, and then you have Unity or <laughs> some kind of visual inspector so that you can grab an element, the sphere, the camera, whatever, and just move it around. Oh, okay, that was enough for that slide, I guess I didn't touch it. Uh, <laughs> what you can do then, well, how it works uh, is getting posed. So that's the big novelty, let's say, of uh, the web VR and now WebXR specification is you get your pose, which again everybody here will know, but it's just your position in space and your orientation in space. So you need the browser to actually understand what that is and then uh, bind it to your camera. And then you need a browser that can actually support it. So uh, there will be a presentation this afternoon also on WebVR with a bit more detail on the specification, status of the specification. Long story short, um, it's been, so I started to play with WebVR about three or four years ago. Uh, every year I've been saying, okay, this is the year of WebVR. But this is the year of WebVR, okay. Specifications, <laughs> yes, I don't learn, but that's okay. Um, the specifications, uh, the 1.0 are landing now. Uh, there should be some uh, release for Firefox Reality soon, uh, for Chrome soon. Um, in the meantime, for VR, you can already use Firefox. So Firefox default on desktop, not on Linux, just on Windows. On Mac OS, I think so, behind flag, yeah, it is. Uh, and then on Firefox Reality, which you have on the go, on the Quest, uh, and somewhere else. And then Exokit, who knows Exokit? Okay, a couple, couple of hands. I'll clarify a bit after. Um, so same here, I don't need to explain so much, but in the end, or maybe, yeah. Uh, for inside our tracking, you find your feature points, uh, you invert them to your position, your orientation, and then uh, it's shipped back to the browser, and then you get your pose. You bind it to your camera, and voila. You have your web VR experience, your WebXR experience. Uh, in terms of uh, controllers, I, I was briefly discussing around coffee. I think VR, um, NAR, we focus on the visuals, it has to be done right, and it has to be good, but I think what's often um, underestimated is interaction. Uh, like, okay, it's, it's brilliant, you put the VR headset, you feel you're somewhere else, but I think uh, you feel you're really there when you push on something and it, it, has, uh, it responds to it. Let's say physics, for example, somehow you put a very simple experience, actually two cubes, uh, just by having physics, it feels real. Even if it looks like the cube is gray, which you've never seen in real life, or you put some flat shading, it doesn't look realistic. But just because it reacts the way you expect, it feels real. So I think interaction, it matters at least as much as, um, I won't even mention photorealism because nobody knows how to do it, even less in real time. But in terms of uh, the, the visual, the quality of the visuals, I think there is too much emphasis on this. It matters, but Interaction really is key. So in order to do interaction on the web, simple, you have the gamepad API. The only difference is um, in order to have your little buttons and everything and your axis, you also have pose again. So you know where your joystick is in space and then you can use it for whatever you want. So I was uh, using this to do a little keyboard um, with the index. Um, yeah, again, very simple. I just have, uh, I pulled the data from, um, any of the uh, buttons I have, the axis, I use the axis to switch the different um, layout of the keyboard so I have my controllers on the side and I can switch um, mm -hmm. to, let's say, a nearly full uh, keyboard with just those two controllers because on the index you have the finger tracking. 
uh, and then yes, then you get a nat natural interaction. Again, if you are as lazy as I am, you don't want to have something too complicated, so you just have your controller, uh, and you have an object, let's say a duck you want to make quack, so you just uh, measure the distance. If the distance is lower than a certain threshold, um, so you measure where your controller is, where the duck, which is symbolized by a box is or cube is, and if the distance is low enough, boom, you have your interaction. So it's really, really straightforward. Uh, so the problem is if you know now how to do, uh, you have the pose for the uh, headset, you have the pose for the controllers, you know, the interactions. Um, the question now is how to do it right. So that's the emphasis back on, let's say, the Quest uh, and Facebook. Uh, there are incredibly good sensors. They are far from what we still hope for, but it's working. Uh, if you want to use it in the office, Kind of okay, I guess, depending on which context. If you use it at home, uh, well, it, maybe you care a little bit more about the privacy you get there. So it's interesting to consider those experiences to inform the user well enough so that they are actually conscious of what kind of data is leaking through or is going through it. So, And yeah, well, you can go a little bit deeper. Um, I think we're still at the very beginning of VR. Like this, this was a headphone, a mobile phone what, 10 years ago, something like this. Uh, this is a mobile phone now. Uh, I think VR is a little bit at that stage. I don't think that's a realistic scenario from my basic understanding of uh, physiology. But yeah, regardless of how we're getting there and, and how long it takes, I think it's really important that now we get it right. Um, for so for AR, I'll just take a huge shortcut. Say it's the same, but harder. Uh, you just see through, but then what is the real challenge is uh, getting contextual information about your environment. Uh, because it means you don't just walk in space, but you know that the floor is actually flat, that the floor is a floor, that the chair is a chair, that there's not just a flat surface. But So all this, as far as I understand, is still quite a bit of a challenge, but it's getting there. So you have quite a few examples. You have the Mozilla XR Viewer, which is an experimental viewer uh, browser on iOS also on GitHub, uh, yeah, same, same kind of interface. If you, have, uh, if you get uh, inside-out tracking for VR, it's about the same. The thing is, as I mentioned, the WebXR 1.0 is already nearly out there, but not fully, so you need to find tricks for it. So you get polyfill, uh, not as good as the real thing, but kind of works. So you had the WebVR polyfill, uh, until recently, and then the WebEx all all on GitHub. And then you have something that just doesn't care about the specs, uh, which is AR.js. So when you start to see um, uh, AR on the web without anything, um, but you have marker or markerless, uh, that's a pretty useful framework. Same for um, workshops if you want people to discover what is AR and they don't have to install anything. It's a great way to use it. You have a little tracker behind it. Uh, or you also have markerless. Uh, that's the latest um, um, iteration of it. Um, there was a little bit of uh, GitHub drama on the passing uh, over the repository, but now what matters is active. The repositories are active again, the PR are going through. Uh, and this is an example of markerless using um, geospatial data uh, to put, again, as you can see on the top uh, in the browser, uh, some of geospatial information. Uh, the XR viewer I briefly mentioned before, so on GitHub. Um, actually, oh, okay, a little bit of suspense. So this is markerless. Uh, you just put your mesh, let's say your GLTF file, uh, in there, and then you can interact with it based on distance, but it was touch uh, on the screen, whatever you want. And then you get little um, little tricks uh, because you can register a protocol. Then if you had your right protocol on it uh, and the app is installed, you can directly use it as if it was a normal browser. Let's say it's still experimental, but the um, the flow uh, or the stream of interaction is rather uh, straightforward. Uh, so the beauty of the web, uh, as I mentioned, is it's a mess. Uh, and it means, for example, when you have an ecosystem like JavaScript, where you have a new framework like now, another one now, 
like another one now, literally. The pace of uh, uh, creation of framework and our tools is it's both scary and impressive. Uh, so that was a little uh, silly test, but basically I used D3GS, so that's a library for visualization. If you went on the New York Times website, you probably saw D3 uh, for interactive graphics to discover about a complex topic. Uh, so I just have a very complex data set, like test one, two, three, four, five, and then I display a mesh, uh, and based on its size, uh, where it is, just in here. Again, just to a uh, little proof of concept. Um, so, I'm on my slide, I'm on my presentation. Okay, and I have this little game. It's actually the portfolio of Simon. Um, just to show that uh, one of the beauty of JavaScript is that you have libraries like physics. Okay, I'm very bad at building, so I'm not going to stop there. Uh, and you have a little tutorial uh, on, on how to do it, but you can just use a component to add um, like D3 or a component to add physics. Um, so it makes you gain your game a lot more realistic. So I briefly mentioned ExactKit. So that's the new challenge in terms of browser. If you want to use, now you don't have Linux support uh, for Firefox, but if you want to use, so I stopped, um, that's my sad story. Uh, I stopped using uh, Linux, well, four years ago when I started to play with VR. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I think one or two years ago, I started to use Linux again because I could, because I cannot spend my time going back and forth between Windows and Linux. Uh, and now that we start to have proper support, but I want to stick to WebVR because that's what I know and that's what I think will have the biggest impact, uh, then I need a browser for it. So on Linux, now you can use Exocket. Exocket is kind of um, a strange thing. So it's a browser, kind of. But it's a browser that says, well, what's exciting uh, in terms of content now, it's not just 2D, that's the past, but it's 3D, it's VR, it's AR. And then uh, everything 2D is legacy, it's too heavy, it's too complicated, you still can have your browser with your super complicated CSS engine, uh, which is an engine proper, and it's using shader and everything behind, so it actually is complicated. Um, but if you want 3D first, why have all this code for it? can have it optionally, but it's going to have to, so it's spinning, or it's turning uh, the browser on its head to say 3D first, VR and AR first, and the rest is optional. So it means you can actually wrap your head around the code base as one person. Um, so yeah, it's on GitHub, I invite you to try it, works on Linux, and they're pretty innovative and creative. I was also mentioning before, they have a bunch of events, like once a week at least, there is on the hubs, some discussion about the metaverse and all uh, the crazy possibilities. So does anybody know what this is? Uh, so ExoKit Web is basically saying, well, you can have one web page that has a VR content, let's say Mozilla Hubs, but imagine that someone else uh, does a page that does, I don't know, um, like a library of uh, 3D meshes that are relevant to your topic, let's say architecture. Well, you could actually, the same way you have iframes, you can have two VR content overlapping. So you have like one origin coordinates and then you bring the two other uh, 3D pages or VR pages next to each other and you can put them in different positions. So here you have multiple pages that are spatial, so they are in VR and they are um, merging the content according to one coordinate system and their own respective coordinate systems. Um, so an old guy saying stuff about whole greater part and stuff. Uh, so I think it, the beauty of it is also having your workflows. So you have, for example, the WebXR emulator. You don't have the device right now. You're in the train, you want to work on it. So you'll just use the emulator. Uh, and what becomes new also is, so I don't know how many of you were at the Blender conference yesterday, but you need, you don't have your experience or your experience without assets. You need something that looks good, feels good. Uh, I'm definitely not an artist, as you can see from some of the Inktober drawings I've done. Uh, but I think being able to use Blender, so for example, uh, the beauty I find for Blender is if you do right click on a function, or actually you do right click on um, an icon, then you can have edit the code right there in the application. And you can change it if you want to, or you can also look how it's working and do your own script in Blender. So it is made to be part of a workflow, it is meant to be integrated. Um, so Arturito um, on uh, Twitter, he's a um, Spanish technical artist and he's explaining his entire workflow. How you can go from your 3D creation, your drawing to some uh, 
usable on the web 3D assets. Uh, goes to PBR uh, and goes also from rigging and animation. It's not just a cube, it can be a cube with PBR and uh, arms flagging based on uh, your interaction. Um, this I'll just skip. Uh, and you can have entirely new workflow. So for Exocet, um, Exocet runs also on the Magic Leap in terms of augmented duality. So what I did was um, uh, instead of using anything from the framework, MLDB, anything like this that would be too complicated for newcomers, uh, you can have one laptop that will be, uh, let's say, the workshop lead. And then anybody who's going to submit their link on the page of the workshop is going to be sent directly to the device. They don't have to install anything. They can just use the web for state-of-the-art uh, AR technology. Uh, so new ways, basically, to, to discover. Uh, this I mentioned before, learning VR in VR, um, painting in VR. So again, in web VR, you can have your content. You paint in it. So if you tried a painter, it's just like Tilt Brush. But on GitHub, and you can modify it, add your brushes, uh, make some like um, sound reactive brushes. And then you can show the content straight away to anybody and invite him or her in your drawing uh, without anything installed. Uh, you can also have, uh, this is actually if you want to try after, um, this can be converted to SVG, have like a special pen that uh, writes the, that record the position of the different spots. Uh, and I have two SVG and then SVG I can extrude it and have my physical drawing straight to web viewer pages. Um, you can use GLTF. So who's familiar with GLTF? I didn't ask that before. Okay. So it's, it's to, to make it short, it's the new format that is going to conquer all 3D formats, you know, like the one spec that's going to replace them all. Um, and it's basically using everything you would want to with a focus on the web. So for example, you can have level of details and streaming of higher resolution texture, streaming of uh, higher resolution geometries based on, let's say, distance to the object. Uh, and you can also hit directly inside the format to say, well, this part of um, the exported um, model that the artist has done, I want to touch this one directly. You can like write the name of a property and access it directly from the web. Uh, and again, in terms of new workflow, um, as you can see, not an artist, uh, but I made my little VR scene uh, in Blender. I have, of course, Suzanne there and WebVR. Uh, I made a little uh, plugin, or I don't know, script, what's the right name for it? Uh, I load it. Um, it packages my scene as a GLTF, uh, and then it sends the GLTF file to the server, wrap it inside an iframe page, or 3GS, I forgot, and then voila. It directly from Blender, I can publish uh, 3D and VR content on the web working in the headset. And then again, in terms of new workflow, so I'm in the Magic Leap, uh, the augmented reality device. I'm using Glitch. So Glitch is a way to uh, have 3D or any kind of web content, actually. We mix it, co collaboratively edit the code. Uh, and then I use my full VR, um, my full uh, physical keyboard to change the code. And then the code is it's not live reloaded. I had to press refresh, but it could be live reloaded. Uh, and then in the headset, I have the new content. So let's play a game. Uh, so this is the stack in WebVR, it's a bit simplifi simplified. Uh, those are the bunch of actors, um, the bunch of uh, also companies behind it and their product. That's kind of the stack at the higher level. Um, so you don't have to, to, you can say it a lot if you want to, but the idea, I think this is something I, I saw at Kronos um, six months ago basically where they try to identify in the stack where are the gaps uh, in the pipeline, the workflow, what is actually missing, what community uh, tools are not there yet compared to uh, non-open uh, source and free alternatives. So where do you think are the gaps? Where do you think is um, what is missing right now, either in WebVR or how to connect to WebVR or WebXR? It's an actual question, yes. I know I see some faces yeah. like a bit surprised, like, wait, do you need to think about it? We can also discuss it about coffee. I don't have to put everybody on the spot. But I think it's something important. Like, if we want actually a, a lively and efficient ecosystem, then we need to be honest about it. Like, what is actually missing? Yeah. Uh, we have more people. Yes. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the great presentation. It was a good overview. Not finished yet. Oh yeah, until now, of course. Looking forward for the rest. Um, 
but uh, it was great to see what you can actually achieve in a simple way with, uh, with the web, with uh, just a couple of lines of JavaScript. And unfortunately, I couldn't dive into it deeply yet, mostly because of the Linux support. So of course, I could try it out on other operating systems, but I am uh, really like to have it on, on my setup. Um, so I saw ExoKit, uh, for, like I knew ExoKit, but I wasn't aware that they already had Linux support, so I will try it. Um, I think that it's currently running on OpenVR, I guess, and SteamVR. Uh, but it would be for, so one thing for me, and uh, I would really also like to uh, t tinker with it, to have ExoKit or uh, even maybe Firefox reality running on OpenXR so it can be on a full open source stack. And I guess uh, this full open source stack from, from the ground up, from the drivers up to the browser fully open source will bring many people and many enthusiasts to this. Uh, and for me, this is one, one thing still missing, still important. It's great that uh, to have like this solid runtimes where this stuff can be developed in a, on a high level. Uh, but yeah, I'm really just looking forward to the open source stack. And the, for me, the small gap is to bring like open XR support to ExoKids or something, mm -hmm. or Firefox Reality. Uh, so I will like to play with that. So ExoKit also is really active, and uh, so it, it's not a on-post project. It's um, it's not an anything goes project, but it's uh, we keep it extremely small and tight to be able to explore. So it's also not the same kind of constraint as Firefox. Not even Firefox really, but Firefox proper would have in terms of shipping to millions of users. So it means it's really able to go crazy. Uh, and yeah, that was my, that's how I was able to switch back to Linux instead of using Windows. It's because I can actually run my content there, so, yeah. It was basically a bit of the same. I think the gaps are in the lower end, like there's, it feels like there's not much uh, open hardware or drivers, basically where one out of it's in, it feels like it's only us and then uh, people like above in the clouds in the web, mm -hmm. don't seem to really care about the platform. That they, oh, we're doing all this fun stuff in open yes. source. It's open source. Yeah, it's open. And then we run on Quest. Yes. And then you're fucked, to be honest, because yes. then you everything you do is being sent to Facebook. So uh, no, no, it's it's uh, definitely true that uh, a lot of um, there is a kind of um, how do you say? an excuse of separation of concern to say we're high up the stack so we we don't want to care about how it's done under the hood or lower down the stack um, I do think it's a concern uh, but that it's not necessarily there is a, um, a hope it's going to be magically sold <laughs> without necessarily wanting to be involved but uh, yeah again I think that's why we're here um, but uh, yeah um, any anything else? Otherwise, again, um, around coffee, that's fine too. Whole lunch. So I'll finish then. Uh, why you should not try WebXR? I mean, if you need to deploy tomorrow, literally tomorrow, Sunday, twenty something, uh, across all platforms. So that's still a hope. That's still the target. That's still what we want. In practice, it's not there yet. Um, what I didn't mention also during who I am, I I was a co-founder of um, a WebVR startup last year, two years ago, and after one year uh, I had to give up because in terms of adoption and in terms of uh, um, testing with users and uh, specifications be to be being implemented, even though this year is the year, this year is different, uh, we're not there yet. So I think if you really need to deploy tomorrow, you need to be a little bit cautious. Um, if you don't care about 3D or new interactions, why would you bother? Uh, I mean, I think it's the most exciting thing out there, but not everybody has the same focus, which is fine. And again, if you need a stable tool chain, I mean, you're working in a nuclear power plant, uh, probably not a good idea right now. Everything is, they're moving pieces, everything is shifting. Um, yeah, maybe wait a little bit more. Play with it on the side, definitely worth it, a lot of fun, but not stable in terms of tool chain. Why you should still invest time in learning WebEx for two more morning? Uh, well, because it works, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty easy. You put the headset, um, actually now, um, 
If we mention the Quest, even though I don't want to, it has the Oculus browser, which works out of the box. You buy, so it means you buy the most probably popular VR headset for Christmas. Don't do it because evil and stuff. But in the end, it has a Oculus browser in it that does support web VR and will support web XR very soon. Um, and it's a new frontier. It's pretty exciting. Uh, and again, to go back to um, the previous points, I mean, if we if you don't shape a new medium, who will? There are so many ways to use it for boring or unintended, just wrong purposes. So just shape the medium, building the content you want to. So I think just a little bit back on the um, higher up the stack, not being so concerned with the lower end of the stack. Some people who also produce web VR content or web XR content, they are not even developers. So in terms of knowledge of how it's done, they don't honestly care. They would rather, um, like even discussion yesterday at the Blender Conf about you're an artist, you want the medium to be free, you want to shape it any way you want, but they don't honestly have the technical understanding of how it's done. What still matters though is the kind of content you can produce through it. Um, the long sentence, point four, is basically, uh, I think, okay, maybe in five, 10, 50 years, everybody will use XR in one way or another. Uh, I'm pretty convinced of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend my weekend like you a Saturday morning here. So I, I'm pretty sure it's the present that will be a much more popular future. Then it's really important to know how it's working. You don't need to know everything. None no, of no, us actually understand entirely the stack. Uh, it's just too many pieces. Um, but to get an understanding of where the information flow, where it goes, I think it's really, really important. And urgent because it's happening now. Like even if you don't use VR or AR uh, and someone else uses it, basically you are represented in it and shipped to whatever commercial system is using it. And I mean, if you have a cognitive science degree, you can also put it to good use today. A uh, little public community announcement. Uh, this is the first time. Uh, if you're in Toulouse, there is the Open Geospatial Consortium um, event mid-November. Uh, and there is the Capital du Libre, which is uh, like first dem, but in France, an open source event. Uh, and I'm organizing a hackathon there, uh, focusing on um, geospatial data and web AR. Yes, it's happening in about a month. Uh, if you have any suggestion, ideas or whatever, uh, well, first come, but even if you cannot come, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, it's all there. Uh, why do I care again about WebXR uh, to be open? Because <laughs> I need it because otherwise I'm going crazy. I have those notes everywhere. I have my posters everywhere. I need a way to um, dump those ideas and uh, tools on a, on a medium that gets, lets me be more free. Let me, like I walk, I'm not Italian, but I use my hands to talk. I like to walk around. I like to have a discussion when we go outside. Uh, so I need to, I do not like this. This is not a natural posture for me. I want to be able to move around with the idea and the information. So I need it. This is why I'm here. Um, but why should you care for XR and WebXR to be open? Uh, well, because I was whining once again on Twitter about Facebook and Google and them being just advertising company with a technical side, but in the end, advertisement. And I think what we get used to is helplessness. Uh, we get used to tools that tell us, no, you cannot do this. And you're like, okay, that's it. They don't even reply if you ask a question or complain about it. And I think gradually you're like, okay, that's how it is. Like I'm in, middle, in my little box and then I stop getting ideas. I stop being creative. Um, so I'm a prototypist, I do proof of concept. If I cannot get ideas, if I cannot be creative, my life is pointless basically. So I cannot accept it. Uh, and, and as it goes, you, you just have to give up or you do, free libre open source software, we said, I don't necessarily know how to do it. I don't know if it's feasible, but at least I know I can try. I know that if I dedicate the time, if I ask the right person, if I go to the right conference, then maybe I'll find a way. I, I cannot promise I will, but I know at least I can try. That's my cue. Uh, so you gain agency, again. You're not just like being used by the software, but you can get uh, active again. So in the end, why should you care for WebXR and XR to be open? Because I think XR is really a novel tool for thinking. I haven't did philosophy talk on it. Uh, so we must keep it free and open. And that's it. Thank you. We do have time for questions if you want to take some. Well, I have goodies. So uh, I will, I will uh, take
take questions and give goodies. Yeah. Um, so you used an example where you said that the user won't be able to tell the difference. Um, I do say that they will be able to tell the uh, difference. Sorry, I cannot. I On the performance, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said that the user won't be able to tell the difference, but I do think they will in the end, like battery matters, especially on mobile devices. So um, yeah, you have a lot of optimizing to do on your stack, I would say. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm being a little bit provocative. Yeah. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm saying that, of course you need performance, of course you need at least 60 FPS, um, but if, if you focus only on, um, on performance and not on uh, content and even on interaction, just let's say on display, um, it's, it's just not enough. And I think because, so one of the, um, a lot of the argument I hear is like, oh, I don't want to touch the web because the web is not performant. Uh, so it's not true. The web is, there is, a, there is overhead, of course. Um, so I'm not going to deny this, but the overhead is against, let's say, uh, how efficiently you can share and how efficiently you get feedback and how efficiently you can edit. Um, so it's a trade-off, uh, and I think the trade-off, because the overhead is actually not as high as most people think it is, um, is not significant enough to forget how um, all the benefits from it, let's say. So yes, of course, performance matters, and of course it has to be, it should always be better, but it, 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 the performance itself of sticking to native uh, is in most cases, in my opinion, unfounded. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so just to add to this, um, the performance is mostly uh, the problem of, of graphics usually, and WebGL and native GL is pretty much the same speed, because once you have the stuff on the graphic card, once you have the shader on the graphics card, it doesn't matter if the web loaded it to the graphics card or something else loaded it to it. Um, the slight difference is, of course, that you're using GL and not Vulkan, but uh, you're pretty close. Uh, and the web doesn't make the big difference in, in that regard, because the, the graphics is usually limit, limiting factor for the, for the VR stuff or for the XR stuff from what I've seen. And as I said, once, in, on, once, once it's on the card, it's, uh, it's pretty much the same. But um, you forgot one, one piece of why you should not web, use WebXR. Uh, and that's if you want to push one app store, mm -hmm. then WebXR is not for you because WebXR doesn't need app stores. <laughs> and if you want to push one app store e ecosystem, then that's not for you. <laughs> well, you can, you can still, for example, if you go back to Exocet or even the Mozic Likes Reviewer, you can wrap your WebXR content as an app. I don't think you should. I think the web is the platform. I think it's wrong, but it's technically feasible. So I mean. We're the group here who doesn't want to be bound by app stores, but <laughs> yes. That was not a question, so you do not get a sticker. <laughs> um, so uh, this is great, and and obviously I'm a, a big proponent of OpenXR. Uh, you know, have a standard backend for WebXR. I you know folks on the committee. It's it's very nice. Um, I also have a collection of. Uh, can we say abandoned platforms? Um, I've got a Gear VR. I recently yep. just got a Daydream View. <laughs> is there? Um, yeah, I know. Ironic. Uh, <laughs> is is there sort of any? Do you know if there like how how what the balance is there between dedication to platforms that people already have versus the platforms that people will be using from now on? How many months do I have before my Daydream View stops working? So Daydream is already... On, on like Firefox reality, yeah, for yeah. instance, because I just checked and uh, it looks like it should work. So one of the um, challenge of the web VR and then WebXR specification was that one of the principal and the constant example was one of the CERN websites uh, still running, what was it, like 30 years after or something like this? So that you want the web to be able to continuously run your content uh, regardless of how old the platform is. 
Uh, so that's a huge challenge though, uh, and especially yeah. based on how uh, quickly those devices are changing. Um, uh, so I do not want to promise that the web is the way, but compared to most platforms, like you don't have a vendor that says, oh, we don't support this anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as you have an app that is a browser that runs on it and that keeps on um, supporting those the specification, so that's why what I actually didn't mention even is um, the specifications are um, done within the framework of W3C. Uh, and within W3C, uh, so the first workshop was in 2016 in Santa Clara at Samsung HQ. And um, so Facebook was there, Chrome, Google was there, Five, Mozilla of course was there, I was there. Uh, just a bit less important, Samsung was there, uh, Kronos was there. Um, so in terms of adoption, it was pretty good. Since then, uh, Apple also joined without announcing anything because they do whatever they want, that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, Magic Leap also joined since. So in terms of adoption from vendors, um, it I will also, again be a little bit provocative, might be more widely adopted than OpenXR. Uh, oh, at this point, I'm sure, yes. So I, th I think it's a rather safe bet. In the end though, it's like I mentioned a bit in the why you should not adapt it. It's all moving pieces, all in motion. So sure. if you want to be sure that it's going to be still running in 20 years or 50 years, I mean, that's also a big part of, let's say the um, web archive is how you can keep on maintaining that content that is always in flux and that one of the beauty of the web, for example, I also did not mention it, but one of the com competitive advantage to say is, um, you can do link traversal. So if you have a WebXR page, you can jump to another WebXR page without going back to a home screen or something like this, which is otherwise not, as far as I know, not possible because otherwise you go through the home um, platform mm -hmm. again. Um, so, but it means it's all dynamic interlinked content. So how this is going to keep in being maintained over here. So yeah, my suggestion would be you actually stick to the specification, maybe you do, if you had published already web VR content, you make sure it's both web VR and web VR compatible. And then within uh, W3C specification and the respect of the implementation from the different browser vendors should be fine. That's great, thanks. Okay, everything else was super clear. And if you want to try stuff, I'm around. Uh, if you want to start a glitch and play with stuff in, uh, in WebXR, not sure if i be able to, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to try regardless, so thank you.